Services Commission for this one. Uh, Parliament, good afternoon and uh, thank you all uh, for joining us for this special session. And before we start, uh, given the uh, significant international focus of today's proceedings, I'd just like to reflect that the thoughts of all of us today uh, here are with those affected by the tragic attack in Istanbul in Turkey uh, last night. Now, Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, President Higgins, on behalf of all my colleagues in the Parliament, can I offer you and Mrs Higgins a very warm welcome here to the Scottish Parliament today. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be your host. Falcha Gu Parliament Nahava. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to extend the hand of friendship to you and to have this opportunity to hear you address uh, this meeting of the Scottish Parliament. Scotland and Ireland, uh, as we all know, uh, share a common heritage, uh, a Celtic industry which goes back centuries. But more than that, I believe we share a bond, uh, a, a, an outlook on life and a set of political, social, cultural and economic interests that tie us together. Our two countries, for example, both enjoy the support of a large diaspora, tens of millions of uh, Scottish and uh, Irish citizens found right across the globe. And our shared enthusiasm for sport, uh, whether that be rugby, Shinty or hurling uh, or for football is evident for all to see. And if I may say so, uh, President Higgins, your own enthusiasm for football was evident for us all to see <laughs> on our TV screens uh, uh, last week uh, following the uh, Ireland-Italy match. Uh, and I'm sure I speak for many, if not all Scots, uh, when I say that uh, we took great vicarious delight in your victory that evening and we commiserate you, with you now and with the national side at finally succumbing to the host nation. If it makes you feel any better, can I point out that you're not the only country uh, coming to terms with your exit from Europe this week? Uh, <clears throat> I actually think you could unite leavers and remainers here in this parliament if you could offer any advice on how Scotland could qualify for the next European <laughs> Championship in the first place. President Higgins, I don't believe any of us would wish to downplay the complexity or the significance of the EU referendum vote for the peoples of Scotland uh, and Ireland. But I very much hope that our two countries maintain a strong and continuing relationship regardless of where recent events might take us. Scotland and Ireland both gain from cooperation in areas as diverse as energy, culture and tourism. Our parliaments, our MSPs and committees already enjoy the benefits of mutual exchange and I'm very keen to promote uh, and continue that interplay of ideas and information. In fact, it is very much uh, my wish that not only are you able to offer us your thoughts and insights on the political challenges that lie ahead, but that your visit here today helps cement that relationship. President Higgins, uh, I've already touched on your sporting interests, but away from football, you have a fascinating career. You are a passionate political voice, a poet and writer, an academic and statesman, a human rights advocate, a promoter of inclusive citizenship, and a champion of creativity within Irish society. You have served at almost every level of public life in Ireland. I believe you're the first president to sit in both the Doyle and the Senate. In 1992, you were the first recipient of the Sean McBride Peace Prize uh, from the International Peace Bureau in Helsinki in recognition of your work, campaigning for human rights and for the promotion of peace and democracy from Ireland to other parts of the world, including Iraq, Somalia and Cambodia. Yours is a life of public service and commitment. And I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of all my uh, fellow members of the Scottish Parliament to uh, congratulate you on receiving your honorary degree of Doctors of Law from the University of Edinburgh. Once again, I would thank you for accepting our invitation. And it now gives me great pleasure to invite you, Michael D. Higgins, President of Ireland, to address the Scottish Parliament. President. <laughs> Presiding officer, first minister, members of the Scottish Parliament, is a cordial eilioch, mar uktroni herin is muran an ordam, ahas gehuete parliament or gorsa 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 parliament nahal. 
presiding officer, First Minister, and I think, may I say, first of all, how very much I would like to be associated with your remarks about the terrible recent loss of life in, in Istanbul. All of us must regret that. As President of Ireland, it is such a great honour to address the Parliament of our close neighbours and dear friends, the Parliament of Scotland. It is a great pleasure to address this House, not merely because of its already proud history, which makes this august institution worthy of the respect of all Democrats, but because of the people who have served in it and who incarnate and perpetuate the ancient political and democratic tradition of the Scottish people, and who are giving it such full contemporary expression. You've already referred to the bonds of kinship in history between our peoples. They are woven thick. They find expression today in a deep affection and empathy between Irish and Scots wherever our paths cross. For ours is a friendship which I deeply value, as I know you do, and as I have been experiencing this visit so far this week. Wonderful meetings uh, with people who value that friendship that exists between us. You might even say that given our shared and complex history, it has often been difficult to say where the Irish ends and where what is Scottish begins, uh, or the other way around. Fundamentally, we are all intermixed migrants whose shared existence owes more to the transience of our migrations than to the sedentary experience of possessions or property. From the ancient tribes who pass between our nations, uh, to farm, to fish, to trade, to preach and to pray, or to make war or to conquer, to take possession from the Celts and the Picts to the Scots and Galloglass. The patterns of migration between Ireland and Scotland are dense and overlapping. They even extend back before history to the age of legend. By the time Scotland emerged onto the pages of written history, Gaelic culture was thriving and gave this land its very name, Scotia, the land of the Scotty the original preferred Latin name for the Gaels or the Irish. So whilst there may have been quite stark differences between Scotland and Ireland from the Middle Ages onwards, there is no escape. This one overriding link that for many centuries, the Irish and the Scots, or rather to say the dominant political elites within Scotland, traced their ancestry back to a common Gaelic origin. We see this expressed, for example, in a letter in Latin that Robert Bruce sent to Ireland, probably about 1315, as he was seeking an alliance with the Irish, so that our nation, Nostra Nazio, the Scots and the Irish nation, might be able to recover her ancient freedom. And he wrote, the king sends greetings to all the kings of Ireland, to the prelates and clergy, and to the inhabitants of all Ireland, his friends. Whereas we and you and our people and your people, free since ancient times, share the same national ancestry and are urged to come together more eagerly and joyfully in friendship by a common language and by common custom, we have sent over to you our beloved kinsmen, the bearers of this letter, to negotiate with you in our name about permanently strengthening and maintaining in Violet the special friendship between us and you, so that with God's will, our nation may be able to recover her ancient liberty. Thus, in this defining period, the Scots and Irish saw themselves as being of the same nation and spoke a common Gaelic tongue, a circumstance that prevailed certainly right into and past the middle of the 14th century. Over the intervening centuries, we have both come to add the English language to our spoken tongues. But there, too, we have taken that language of Shakespeare and moulded it in our own unique ways, giving it back to the world, changed, I believe, and enriched and enlivened with our own sounds and syntax. 
Barnes and Yates, Haney and McDiarmid, Stevenson and Joyce, Wilde and Duffy, Welsh and Doyle, all have shaped the English language as it is known today. I often think of Derek Walcott putting this, how treat I this tongue of Shakespeare. The intertwined nature of our shared past has had a reciprocal influence on the destiny and the fabric of each of our countries, perhaps more than we realise. Perhaps we have both too often been defined and too often we have defined ourselves through the prism of our relationship with our neighbour England to the detriment of a full appreciation of the rich historical links that unite our two lands across the North Channel. We are, after all, social and migratory creatures who carry multi-layered identities which do not and should not imprison us from new imaginative worlds or curtail either our curiosities, our courtesies, and above all, our hospitality. Of course, our overlapping histories have not always been characterised by harmony. Our national stories have been marked by discord, divisions, and at times great tragedy. In the 17th century, the plantation of Ulster by mainly Scottish farmers would irreversibly alter the history of Ireland and Scotland. In the 18th century, one of Ireland's best known and best loved laments, Mogilliamar, captured the sorrow felt after the Battle of Culloden and the flight of Bonnie Prince Charlie. The sadness of exile, as we would say it in Irish, Joriach, the sense of loss experienced by those left behind, captured in so many of the shared themes of our songs, stories and poetry, are feelings which will always resonate with nations such as ours. The intense pride that we both take today in our diasporas, and I'm accompanied in my visit by the Minister for the Diaspora and International Development, Joe McHugh, but that interest in our diaspora has some of its roots in the tragedies and suffering of past centuries. When famine devastated Ireland, for example, in the 1840s, the Scottish Highlands were also being brought low by hunger and the Great Irish Famine and Gartha Moor. We've had difficulty in putting a name on it, as whether it is the year of the failure of the Padeshu, the Great Famine, the Great Hunger, and so on. It had that impact on the Irish psyche. But it did not just reshape the Irish nation. It reshaped our relationship with Scotland. In 1841, the Irish represented just 4.8% of the population of Scotland. Yet by 1848, just seven years later, just in the height of the famine, it was estimated that an average of a thousand Irish people arrived in Glasgow every week, second only to Liverpool. And by 1851, 7.2% of the population of Scotland was Irish, whereas in England and Wales, it was just 2.9%. The story of these movements between peoples is complex and the adjustment in the figures I've just quoted did not occur without difficulty. The 19th century, with its economic upheavals and ideologically driven policies, pitted an insecure, settled poor against the impoverished migrants arriving in such numbers, often using confessional difference as a wedge to sow enmity. I've often, in my own references, use the work of such as Professor Bernard Aspinwall, who is among those that I have drawn on when examining the experience of those Irish migrants in the 19th century. With their associated conflicts, be they sourced in perceived economic threats, fundamentalisms of various sorts, or simply stereotyped exclusions. Thus, the famine memorial that is planned for Glasgow promises to sensitively and inclusively memorialise that time when famine stalked the land and both peoples were sorely afflicted, thrown on each other as it were by hunger. I think this is an exercise in ethical remembering that is appropriate, for I do believe that an informed and respectful recognition of the complexities of our common past 
an ethical remembering and transaction of old hearts, rather than any affected amnesia, can best help us build a better future. And thus, events of the past lose any capacity to damage our present or limit the possibilities, the possibilities of the future that both of our peoples might enjoy. Today, we do stand together in very different circumstances, confident and prosperous nations with shared challenges that are, as you have said, both regional and global. Divisions of creed or allegiance have, to a very great extent, melted away, or at least abated to such an extent, that we can appreciate more clearly this long history to which I've been making reference, and above all, its often neglected migratory quality that we both share. We can see before us now the enormous potential for partnership and cooperation, grounded in the values that we share as peoples who cherish creativity, our word in Irish that we both had, crohiocht, as a social creativity, crohiocht, as a socially sourced and shared resource. Values that, yes, can lead to innovation and economic benefits, but which constitute most of all a, a valuable imaginative bedrock of citizenship. The innovative person does best in a creative society, one that has structures and institutions that allow for and enable creativity to emerge in all its forms. And we are both now seeing creativity as a departure point for policy, rather than in any residual or narrowly utilitarian sense. Before I became president of Ireland, presiding officer, in my role as a member of Dáil Éireann, I, I had the opportunity to discuss these issues here in this parliament with some of your cultural institutions and communities. And I'm so pleased to see that cultural and intellectual institutions continue to enjoy strong support and are accorded priority in Scottish public policy. In 2013, I also had the privilege of making my own personal pilgrimage to the island of Iona, where I was able to pay tribute to St. Colum Kill, a dairyman, Ostera Colum Killer, and the founder of the island's greatly influential abbey, a monk who valued the creation and acquisition of knowledge, and even more importantly, its dissemination. Values which both Ireland and Scotland have taken to heart and have made manifest across the centuries through a commendable commitment to generalist education. Building on that shared tradition of education and learning, Ireland and the devolved Scottish Executive and Parliament are now identifying exciting new areas for cooperation where our two nations and their peoples with their unique skills and talents can combine to meet the challenges and opportunities of a technological age. As two small in population terms, that is, yet highly skilled countries with highly skilled workers on the edge of Europe, we share a belief that our combined resources, expertise and experiences can create a dynamism that is greater than the sum of our two separate economies. Today, we see great progress, as you have mentioned again, in trade and cooperation in areas such as the creative industries and information technology, as well as in areas as renewable energies and, of course, in the agri-food sector and in tourism. The ease with which citizens of both of our countries can place these economic and material dimensions of shared life within a frame of culture and social cohesion, accepting the value of mutuality, was a, and remains a distinguishing feature of the connection between political economy and ethics that we associate with Scotland. And in contemporary terms, for both of us, it is a very powerful asset. We are both in terms of our peoples and their institutions, committed to deepening this bond. In the past year alone, Ireland has grown its diplomatic representation in Edinburgh, and the Scottish Government has established a representative office in Dublin. 
I welcome this, as I believe that the potential for growing our work together is in culture, in economic and social development, and in promoting the peace, stability and sustainability that have marked the transformative recent decades between these two islands. Indeed, I was also pleased to have a meeting with the First Minister on Monday, and in the last fortnight, the First Minister hosted a meeting with the Taoiseach and representatives of all administrations in the British Irish Council in our hometown of Glasgow, in which key challenges of today were to the fore social inclusion, educational attainment, provision of housing. And this is work that we must continue together. And I want to con commend Scotland's leadership in this body and the work of all the developing structures for cooperation between our governments and our peoples. We see, too, how Ireland and Scotland, as nations with a particular history on the world stage, can also play an important role in addressing issues which are of an inescapably global nature. Scotland has long been a source of illumination for the other nations of the world. I spoke of this at the University of Edinburgh yesterday when I was awarded a, a, a Doctorate of Laws honoris causa. But whether it is the lighthouses of the Stevenson family or to the dazzling early promise of that early period in philosophy of the Scottish Enlightenment with its trust in reason and its grounding in the early period in a balance between science and ethics, Ireland too has for a long been an outward-looking nation, committed to the principles of internationalism and multilateralism. Yesterday, I said in the university, yesterday evening, universities are remembered for the ideas they produce, allow and release into the world. And thus, the key issues of our time, global development, global poverty, climate change, building peace, and the achieving or the prevention of conflict and the resolution of conflict. These all demand all of our engagement. And those of us with our different capacities and histories and resources must challenge ourselves to come up with solutions to the unresolved issues of global poverty, food insecurity, desertification, unsustainable levels of debt, distorted trade, and well-documented abuses of power. We have, in recent years in all regions of the world, seen the consequence of unsustainable economic models which have fomented instability, widened inequalities. We recognise that we live in an unjust world where those who consume are not the same as those who suffer the consequences of excessive consumption, where the burden of climate change falls all too often on those least equipped to bear it, where conflicts rage while the outside world looks on, seemingly at times indifferent, a world that trades in the rhetoric of reason while living with irrationality in unaccountable financial markets and speculative economic flows and that allows a near impunity for massive ecological devastation visited on the poorest peoples and particularly on vulnerable indigenous peoples. Insatiability, far beyond the wealth of nations, and indeed, of course, the theory of moral sentiments was the greater book eight years earlier of Adam Smith. And the insatiability has been unleashed with consequences that have flowed from a fractured relationship between nature, science, economy and ethics. The quenched voices of the spirit and the heart that informed political economy at its best moments and those glowing moments, as I think in, in the early Enlightenment, including its Scottish moments, they are a mere echo now, dismissed as normative, and therefore easily excluded from discourse that is narrowly utilitarian and intolerant. We may be at a turning point. The Sustainable Development Goals, which are recently agreed upon by the United Nations, are of course an opportunity for engagement, and they contain an urgent exhortation to action. 
They call for new economic and development models to be brought forward, ones that are aimed at ensuring that development, be it here in Europe or in Africa, serve the basic needs and human rights of communities, rather than being subservient to some unrestrained and unaccountable financial markets without accountability. Assumed ideologically to be self-balancing, taken with the Paris Agreement on climate change, governments and parliaments now have a blueprint towards which to direct a radical shift in thinking that is so pressingly needed. In addressing issues like global poverty, and I said to the young graduates yesterday, I hope that you succeed where my generation and other generations failed in addressing so many of these issues. Those brilliant young people with science and commerce and law degrees who are capable, as I suggested, of creating a new enlightenment to give us the new theories, the new thinking, the new policies that we need. It will be insufficient to rely, as some do, on however it is presented however palliatively philanthropy I might have to offer. We must summon all of our creative and innovative capacities to find new solutions, both moral, technological and social, to the problems affecting our planet in order to meet the basic needs of populations. I've spoken in some speeches abroad of a civilization of sufficiency, and these solutions must be delivered as a question of right rather than as a concession of charity or an imposition of unsustainable models of consumption that are offered and imposed in the name of a contestable form of modernization. This means challenging entrenched ways of thinking and understanding, understanding the world in a different way, above all, allowing the space for pluralist discourse and scholarship. Ireland is committed to playing its part in reimagining our approach to these questions. And I believe that Scotland, with its strong intellectual tradition, will have an invaluable role in addressing these great issues as well. And that once again, I think you are showing leadership in your ambitious targets for climate change and renewable energies. That great intellectual tradition of this country, grounded in a fine appreciation of that most necessary of balances between reason and morality is an invaluable wellspring from which we can all draw. I have referred earlier to that Scottish philosopher Adam Smith and to the importance of his earlier work, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, where, where he argued that ethical concerns must underpin our social and economic systems. His eight year late, work of eight years later, The Wealth of Nations, is perhaps the work that has generated the most frequently misquoted and abused count of both text and intention. Indeed, it was Smith in that earlier work who argued that our understanding of what is right and good is formed by living in communities alongside other people by learning to value their happiness and to share in their sorrows, to feel as they feel, to cultivate what Adam Smith called moral sympathies. That is the atmosphere of Scottish moral thought of Smith and Hume and so many others. And today their words glow like coals. Regrettably, the international economic order, which would be invoked, on the abuse of, for example, the wealth of nation, would find neither approval or space for ethics. Yet Smith's idea of moral sympathy, moral sympathy, resonates powerfully today. Our Irish and Scottish communities can be conceived of as participating in a series of concentric circles. The innermost circle is made up of the national collective, with whom it is easiest for us to empathise through the instincts of familiarity. The next layer is the European collective, people who are bound together by values, values our lifestyles and institutions. Next then are our diasporas, which you have referred to, and with those with whom we share, not only a culture and a history, but our shared aspirations for a sustainable life and a fragile planet, 
and a security based on the elimination of fear that is based on the absence of the necessities of life. We must challenge ourselves, I suggest, to extend our moral sympathies beyond these proximate circles to those with whom all we, sh we share in our common humanity. As Smith put it, our goodwill is circumscribed by no boundary but may embrace the immensity of the universe. The challenge then is to take that goodwill and translate it in contemporary terms into action. Around that period, too, is the period of that great phrase, man's inhumanity to man makes countless thousands mourn. If we imagine ourselves in the position of those currently fleeing war-torn Syria, are trapped in an unending cycle of conflict in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, are future generations condemned to live in toxic and hostile environments. We cannot acquiesce with inaction or deliver an averted gaze. For a long time, the Irish and the Scots found that our own people were forced to seek sustenance abroad. The strength and vitality of our diasporas today can be attributed to the bravery and indomitable spirit that motivated our ancestors to seek not only better lives for themselves and their families, but also to recognise the value of community and to appreciate the welcome they received on foreign shores, and then to go on and make their own contribution to the common shared welfare of all. Perhaps, then, these are the great resources of tradition and values that we have, and from them we might be expected to play leading parts in showing the ethical leadership that is so needed at this moment in our history. As I come to the end, finally, may I say, as a former Member of Parliament, as you have said, for three decades, May I speak directly to you as parliamentarians? I congratulate you on the recent landmark of the fifth election to the Scottish Parliament. And I want to wish the new members of this House well. And I wish you all, every one of you, success in the next parliamentary sessions, which will see additional powers default to Scotland, and I am sure the many challenges you will face. The French philosopher Michel Foucault tells us that three things were key to the functioning of that ancient democracy, that Athenian democracy of which he wrote. Isonomia, which means that all are equal before the law. Isagoria, that all have equal rights to speak. And finally, parousia, perhaps the most complex of all, usually translated as free speech. I betray my age in quoting these Greek terms. But Foucault understood it as something else, an imperative to speak the truth, even especially if you suspect your words may not be well received. Think of Plato's displeasure, for example, at Socrates' question and his method. It is not surprising to me that in this city that I might call the Athens of the North, we find such a fierce commitment to equality to allowing people to use their voices to speak their mind, and to having the tough conversations. We Irish and Scots have a reputation for this, and we should not shirk from it. We must continue to assert the necessary importance of critical thinking, pluralist scholarship, and the necessary institutional changes for what we must have the courage to call again emancipatory living. As I have previously said in addresses to the European Parliament and to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, Parliament is where the invaluable tradition of deliberative politics is put into practice. In Parliament, it is imperative that we engage in robust debate and discussion. We must be unafraid to challenge outdated policies, received and often untested wisdoms and inequalities which have ceased to shock us by how widespread and familiar they have become. Parliamentarians cannot abandon the necessity of such discourse, leave a vacuum that will be exploited, often by uncohate 
and more usually by dangerous populisms in the street. The democratic tradition was most recently exercised on the question of course, as you've said, on the United Kingdom's membership of the European Union. And while these votes were explicit expressions of support for one or other of the two sides, they were also affirmations of the importance citizens attach to exercising choice within the democratic system. It takes bravery to challenge consensus, but it also requires courage to commit to governing cooperatively, collaboratively, and with respect. The growth of a temporary incoherent populism in Europe and America shows that the values we have strived so hard to put into practice in our democratic systems and the forms of communication, the language of respect and connection upon which they are relied are not impermeable. So we must respond to demagoguery with an informed, open, respectful, tolerant, and engaged discourse, and with respectful debate. We are challenged to do democracy better, rather than resile to old and divisive myths based on exclusion, and often to what is thinly veiled hate or racism. We must reflect on whether we believe or not in a new expanded form of literacy, that expects, that simply states that nothing is beyond the capacity for understanding or comprehension of our citizens, including economic, social, and fiscal matters. But running like a golden thread through political theory and practice at home and abroad is an old Enlightenment concept, the concept of empathy. This is where Scotland has led by example, but now our responsibilities are greater than ever. We are all of us as parliamentarians, as Democrats and as citizens, for I am shocked by the recent death of one of our number, Jo Cox, who was murdered while carrying out her democratic functions as a representative of the people. Jo exemplified the very best of principled public representative politics, and we all of us who share her fearless commitment to principled and respectful political debate, owe it to her, to her memory, to work harder than ever at this crucial moment to strengthen our democratic system, to make it work, to meet the needs of our people, and not to surrender to fear or bend before the politics of fear. Of a Nirati, Erson or Dow Kyanta, Agazarson Winton Halden. As you begin your parliamentary term, may I wish you all well in your efforts for your constituencies and for all the Scottish people and for all of the people, as I said, on our fragile planet. May I conclude by saying that the welcome on false Creole that I have received in Glasgow and now here today in Edinburgh has touched me very deeply. And I take it as a mark of the warmth of the relationship between our peoples, a relationship that, as I have described it, and as you know it better, has such a rich history. But most importantly, it has such a promising future. We may be two nations, as we are often described at the edge of Europe, but we are both, to borrow MacDiarmid's great line, infinite multiform. We share a moral vision and an ethical impulse based on empathy, that great word, and unrelated to any other forms of influence we might yield. We can be influential advocates for those who struggle to make their voices heard in our world, and stricken by our ancient democratic traditions and now their contemporary expressions, our present institutions, we can ensure a sustainable and peaceful future for all of our people. It has been such a great honour as President of Ireland to have the opportunity to accept an invitation of speaking to you. And thank Garamila Mahage Asak Ishtalaklam. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you.
Oh, pardon me. I've got my stage directions entirely wrong there. <laughs> Thank you very much, President Higgins. I think we were incredibly touched by your comments there. It's rare that we have someone of such eloquence speaking to well. So, uh, no offence to my parliamentary <laughs> colleagues. Such thoughtful eloquence. Thank you very much. Can I call upon the Deputy First Minister to respond on behalf of my colleague, parliamentary colleagues? Deputy First Minister. Presenting officer, uh, President Higgins, the, the presenting officer seems to be uh, offending most people <laughs> his remarks today. <laughs> it's an enormous pleasure. Uh, President Higgins to welcome you and Mrs Higgins to, to Scotland and as has been demonstrated by all of my parliamentary colleagues across the political spectrum to express our heartfelt thanks for the most magnificent contribution you have made to the proceedings of our parliament not just today but since this parliament was founded 17 years ago a contribution that all of us will never forget for its depth and its thoughtfulness and it's a reminder to us of the powerful philosophy of moral sympathy uh, given to the world by one of our great sons, Adam Smith, as a reflection of words and thought formulated hundreds of years ago, but of greater relevance today than at any other time it could have been crafted. Your visit, President Higgins, is a timely opportunity for us to celebrate the deep and enduring relationship between Scotland and Ireland. You've made an enormous personal contribution to encouraging these connections. You made reference in your own speech to your visit in 2014 to Iona, the spiritual heart of Scotland, to mark the 1450th anniversary of the arrival of St Columba, a visit that reinforced the common roots of the deep heritage of our two countries. It was a beautiful day in Iona, but it was a beautiful day of hope and friendship that has left a lasting legacy, not just in the islands of Argyll, but throughout our country. A generation earlier, you delivered a seminal address to the 1982 Celtic Film and Television Festival in Glasgow that mapped out an ambitious and creative approach to encourage cultural cooperation between our two countries. The concert in Glasgow on Monday evening that you attended along with the First Minister and with Mrs Higgins celebrated those cultural connections and were a testament to the vision that you encouraged us to imagine over 30 years ago. And the encouragement of cultural cooperation has been such a powerful and effective approach in overcoming some of the barriers and obstacles and the divides that have blighted relationships between people from different traditions in the past. During your current visit, you have been awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Edinburgh. And I read this morning your magnificent Laurentian address to the graduates of the university yesterday. You told these fine people yesterday that Scotland and Ireland are nations who facilitate and value dialogue, nations who wield moral authority rather than a sword, and we are also nations that believe in the power of education and ideas to change the world. Well, these words are particularly timely as we come to terms with the implications of the EU referendum. The First Minister is in Europe today to, per to pursue the mandate that she was given by Parliament yesterday to work to protect Scotland's valued and precious relationship with the European Union and its member states. In this respect, the First Minister appreciated her conversation with the Taoiseach yesterday. This Parliament also united yesterday to express its solidarity with people from other countries who have chosen to come and to live and to study and to work here in Scotland. We as a country are at ease with the free movement of people. Why? Why? Because we have all had such a long-standing experience of people from many countries, originally and principally from Ireland, coming to make their lives here and to enrich our country as a consequence. Now, we value the deep economic ties that bind us together. And last night, you and I were given a glimpse of those economic ties by the principal of Edinburgh University who informed us both that 15,000 Irish navvies took just one week to lay the original tram lines in the city of Edinburgh. <laughs> there are many of us that wish <laughs> such an approach could have been replicated the second time that we tried. I dare say the planning regulations were slightly less restrictive <laughs> in that era. But Ireland is the sixth largest export market for Scotland, with an 11% increase in the value of trade between 2013 and 14.
We value the trade activity that takes place on food and drink, on low carbon, on energy, on finance and IT. We cooperate on a range of EU transnational programmes that have brought valuable research resources to our two countries and have created much stronger institutional collaboration as a consequence. We were delighted as a government to open a new innovation and investment hub in Dublin, which demonstrates the importance the government places on our relationship. I'm proud of the progress the hub is making so far, and we welcomed a trade delegation in May led by the British Irish Chambers of Commerce and look forward to a reciprocal mission of Scottish exporters later this year. I'm also delighted that we now have an Irish business network in Scotland, which was launched earlier this year and which will help to connect our businesses and identify and explore new collaborative opportunities. The Scottish Government strongly believes in working together with our neighbours. In times like these, while there is uncertainty about the UK's relationship and future with Europe, our cooperation is more important than ever. We are determined to do all that we can to foster a deep relationship with our neighbours. You have inspired us in our purpose as we look forward with enthusiasm to the further flourishing of Scotland's relationship with Ireland. Thank you, President Higgins and Mrs Higgins, for your visit to Scotland. It has been a, a wonder to receive you into our country and to start off our parliamentary proceedings of this term with the grace and the eloquence which you've shared with us today. Thank you. Can I thank you, Mr Swinney, particularly for sparing my blushes and rescuing me from that situation and for, more importantly, for expressing our gratitude to you, uh, President Higgins. Thank you very much. I now close this special session of the Scottish Parliament.